Hey guys, welcome to Tiny Texas Houses. We're actually getting ready to show you all the work that they've been doing on this place and to kind of show you what the package is going to be. She'll stand back over here a little bit and you'll see the beautiful little angles that are now becoming more apparent. This is the underlayment that will go underneath the metal and they're going to do a very unique metal shingle roof. I'm going to get a sample of it and then we're going to be doing, um, they're painting them. And they're going to be putting them up. They are beautiful, by the way. i got a sneak peek in them. So. And so I've got lots of these in the back of different kinds. And we're going to show you kind of what they're doing. Gorgeous. This is where they painted them. And it kind of gives you an idea compared to what some of them will look like. And this is a, one of a pattern. And we've got several different patterns of shingles. These are roofing shingles that went on in the 1890s and 1900s. So the dents you see in those are caused by hail and um, they uh, lasted over 100 hail years damage. Okay. on the roof and now we're going to use them again and this is an example of another one they're going to be working with and this gorgeous this looks like clouds and so I don't have a lot of these but you can see they'll need a little bit of work now when they're put together this actually slips right into the other one so that they actually end up forming and this one's got a little bit of a bend right there so what they'll do is come through straighten those kind of things out and then they all slip together and that way they form a, a straightened out a solid bed yes. now perfect up here this hi Andrew glad you're watching and uh, we're getting ready to put the edging on how tall is it this is actually smaller than the packages we're looking at offering. You can get them this small. And this is what's called a fair weather house. They're not going to do a lot of insulation. They're going to make it so that you can go into it in the nice times of the year. And it'll have windows that keep the, um, the rain out of there. But it's not going to be made to be heated and cooled. You don't really need to in Texas for most of the year. So, it's actually going to be this tall or is about... Anna and Andrew are watching. Okay, hey, hey. <laughs> so um, this is actually a smaller version, so it's about a foot shorter, if you can imagine, than the other one we'll be making. The, the model we're going to be offering a package on will also be a foot wider at the widest point, and it's going to be small enough at the bottom to go on a 16-foot trailer like you would rent for $25. And you'd be able to actually jack it up, put it on a trailer, strap it down and haul it down the road and not have to have a permit and then drop it off out in the middle of nowhere and not have to have a permit that's the idea it's called loopholes loopholeology you find out what the maximum size of the hole is and you drive a truck through it or a trailer or a house so the rules in texas are it can't be taller than 13.5 on the trailer without a permit it can't be wider than 104 inches so you want to make it, well, narrower. And even with the eaves and the overhangs, this thing will only be a little over eight foot wide on the widest point. And then the bottom, the reason I'm making it narrower is so that you can slide it on and off of a trailer, a flatbed, um, like you might use to haul cars, or even to haul um, oh, 7,500 pounds of anything. That's what I'm, I'm going to try to keep these under 7,500 pounds. Now, admittedly, <coughs> I would recommend using a little heavier trailer if possible, but the idea is to build something that it will fit on the trailer and it will transport without a permit if you want to, just in case you want to take it out someplace that you don't want to tell everybody about. In other words, pull a permit. Now, this house, we're actually going to have a ceiling in here, and the ceiling's going to go down there. And there's going to be an air gap in there, and um, if you want to put insulation in, that's going to be where you put it at, would be in that space right in here. This will be for flow of air and venting so that you can actually ventilate these areas out and keep the heat from building up in there and that would allow that not to have insulation but to be able to depend upon airflow instead for fair weather houses in texas um, that's all you need to worry about is to keep the wind out and you can have a little fire in here in this case we're going to have a little area where you can actually have candles or fire burning and what you're looking at when you look at the way these are put together um, <clears throat> this is almost right and it's going to be uh 
um, a, a space in here that gives you cover when you're standing on the steps on both ends and it allows us to have this have a wire or something on here and a door so that in the winter time or summertime you can close or open it depending on if you want to keep it warm or cooler in there overall they're doing a really good job for kids that have never built anything before don't you think we're proud of you guys yeah so this you inspire is, um, me Anna this is actually way overbuilt as far as this two by sixes you can get by with two by fours this has a lot of two by six on here this was originally started by some other kids a long time ago and never finished so we're gonna go ahead and turn it into something we're gonna make packages of the more improved version that you could actually live in another thing about this one this is only 10 foot long this side and we're looking at making one that's gonna be 14 foot long for part of the package and I'm about to get down off this ladder and show you why so knowing that from where she is that's a good spot mm -hmm. now you can see in here why I want a little wider this is about six foot. If we make it eight foot on the outside, then I'd have seven foot, which happens to be about what you need to have a bed. In case you want to have a bed. Ah, that way. <laughs> and uh, the other way of doing it is by making this four Hi, foot Stacey. longer. Hi, Stacy, you still need to come visit again. If you make this four foot longer, you know we have a double bed at the end of this, and all this is just living room. That's a lot of living room. Considering you have a bed up here, and have storage space, a dresser, whatever you want, even a small desk down here. This plan would allow you then to go ahead and have a kitchen on this side over here. Now, the idea is there's lots of counter space, plenty to do over here if you want to, and still have a little living area. Now, personally, I like my bed hanging on ropes. And if you're living by yourself, you might very well, very well might want to have a, a bed on the shorter version well, your bed actually has ropes right here, the whole half of it, and then it folds up during the daytime and just comes down at night. And you get up in there and go to bed. It's like a bunk bed on the yeah, side. Like a bunk bed on the side. And that allows you to store your bed up this way. It's just a platform with a futon on it. This size actually works for guest houses, for B&Bs. This would be a really nice way to do it because one of the loopholes is in Texas. If it's under 200 square foot and it's a portable building, there's no bed and breakfast tax of 15%, which at $100 a night, that turns into some money. This is an idea for doing a really cool little fireplace inside your house where you might have the fireplace protected so the fire doesn't get away. You have candles in here to heat it at night, or maybe a little tiny um, um, alcohol stove. These are parts that I have that are cast iron, new old stock. They're actually made back in the 1800s. And this tin, same thing, made in the 1800s. That means you don't have to use up carbon fuel. You don't have to go mine this beautiful cast iron front for a fireplace that's never been installed. We have a bunch of these, by the way. It even has a date on it. And it's, uh, these are made up north. Imagine what it costs just to bring them from up there in North Michigan all the way down to Texas. So. I have a bunch of these and other styles, and you can just take that with some tin, tin on the sides, and you have some beautiful. Now, when we get done with this one, this it's actually going to have a ledge over here. It's going to have tin going up and wrapping over it on both sides, and underneath, and this would be sitting higher, and this would be like a little area to have candles and prayer candles and things like that, because it'll end up being a little tiny chapel. If you have a desire, you can actually put, and there will be a lot more of it on here. This metal, for example. Now what we did is we took some of this old metal and hit it with a grinder and buffed off all some of the paint and then it'd be clear coated and that will shine for many, many, many more years. Yeah, with the paint on it and all crackly, you can't appreciate the pattern. So doing something like this, you really get to see the pattern pop. Now, another case over here where the paint's so cool, you don't want to take too much of it off. Yes, that's right. This is another great example, and you can see how that's going to work. If you look at the comparison, I'm not going to want to take that much of that green yeah, paint off because it's really gorgeous. pretty. So you want to highlight it even. And you can see underneath here where some of the paint's already come off, but one of the things that's really unique, if you see that in there, I'm not sure if you can see it, there's an iridescence in that metal. So when the metal was originally yeah. pressed, that purpling and stuff, that was from the metal presses getting hot. 
So that means that if you actually did strip this carefully and don't do too much abrasiveness to it, you'd actually have that iridescence show through. Now, cool. some of these others, like this, incredible patterns that looks like it's not any good, actually pretty darn solid still. But the really, really good ones, um, you can still get these and use them and we have a bunch of this by the way. It's in thousands of square feet of it. But And the pieces that are crown molding that go. This is that molding pattern I was telling you must be the top of a ledge in here. And I actually had a couple of pieces that were crosses, which I think they might have cleaned up for me, that are around here someplace. But one thing I'll tell you, whenever you're messing with this stuff, that spot right there was just the other day, it bites. If you don't have gloves on, it will jump out and bite you. There's another beautiful pattern. So one of the considerations we're looking at was running the two foot tile on the ceiling in there. And they, by hitting that with the, buff, with the grinder, grinding wheel, be able to go ahead and have that up there. And when I say how cool this is about how fast it cleans it up and stuff, watch, I'm gonna show you something. Follow me over. Going down the ladder. Okay, kids. This is one of those do not do this at home things. And if you're gonna do this, don't do it like I'm doing it. What am I doing? Well, I'm gonna go ahead and show you how the grinder works. And I'm not gonna go ahead and put on the protective glasses. And I'm not gonna go ahead and put on the protective mask, because I'm gonna hold my breath. I'm gonna stand over here and zoom it so I don't have any yeah. problems. <laughs> and, and it's gonna throw them that way, so you get over there. Okay. All right. Well, we're not gonna do that because it's not plugged in. This is called live. Hi, Jasmine. Yeah, we're glad to be back. We're going to do some more live videos. This is a lot of fun. Aha. Look what we're going to do this quickly. There's a before one, and there's the after one. Look at that shine. That's just a quickie. Look you can rapidly shine. see how this is going to clean up. If you don't hit too hard with the grinder, there's a baby grinder that goes a little easier. That's a monster grinder. <laughs> but, look as you can imagine. I mean, look at the shine. This is the before. This is the after. Look at that. All the details are popping. So, that's giving everybody an idea of how you can use salvage metal, salvage wood, salvage iron. Oh, those iron pieces are incredible. I got really a lot of options for those old fireplaces. So far, we've had to buy screws. They had to get their tools. I had them buy at DeWalt, battery tools. I personally like them very much. And also it's because you get consistency with so many different tools with the same battery. So, ideally you want to put a cabinet and you want to have certain tools. And all this house right here, you can pretty much build whoops, with this. Oh, and this is a dream battery, nine amp hours. This is a typical battery, one amp hour. If you're doing anything serious, this runs out fast. This does not. So. You get the wall, and then all your batteries match. So, if you want to use a Torx head screw gun, which I highly recommend ratchet. The reason I recommend these is that's the only thing that'll drive screws into that wood. If you try to use a Phillips head, it won't work. Trust me, old wood, you have to have it. But that way, with that kind of thing, you can also drive 
lumber screws and that allows you to put two by fours together and those will be the, what you use in order to put your parts together oh yeah you definitely want to have that kind of power timber locks are the way to go you can there's your your absolute essential tool for putting houses together ratchet driver Damn ideally awesome. a drill and the old style had these big ass batteries they were not very efficient they're 18 volt 14 volt don't buy these you can get a converter for them and the converter allows you to take an old one and put a new battery on it oh that's cool now it's all pretty expensive but it does allow you to at least retrofit old tools with new batteries now I don't think they're quite as vicious. This is actually a very good drill because it has this type of a chuck on it. But again, having that on there is a big advantage. Now, being able to get it back off again is a big advantage too. So, thinking about tools you buy, if you buy DeWalt and you buy this type of a battery thing, you get all the tools, the drills, the sawzall, and everything. You don't have to worry about is how to charge them up. So the old ones have these big old batteries, and once they're obsolete and you can't get those batteries anymore, the tools are obsolete. So, the fact that they made that converter, it's very important. And that's the nice thing about DeWalt. It's a big enough company that if they change something, they'll figure out a way at some point to satisfy the customers. So, that's your little tool lesson. And as you can tell, by the yellow, I've stuck with it for a long time. And I'm not going to say that everybody's going to agree with me on this. I'm not getting paid a penny, by the way. I do not get any endorsements from them. I wish I did. I wish I yes, had all Hi, DeWalt. Walt. Listen to us. Yes, DeWalt. <laughs> Please, think about that. But um, if you're going to build tiny houses out in the field, um, you're going to use air power, you're going to use electric power. And so go with tools that are masters of that realm. And you can still go to DeWalt again as a power, 120 volt, high powered professional tool. That's what this is. It's a heavy monster. You're not going to spend the $400 on one of these. You don't need it. Don't go buy a Ryobi or something like that because you're not going to get enough hours out of it for building your houses. Chop saws. That's an old one out there. It's been outside Look. forever. It wasn't taken care of. More people cut their hands off and their fingers off because this will allow this thing to slide forward normally. This one's in such bad shape it won't. So all this is good for now is a chop saw. This is disabled because it wasn't taken care of. But that's... People put a board here and they cut like that and this thing will come zoom right on top of their thumb. This cuts off more fingers than any other saw in a shop. But again, I stay with DeWalt, why? They're pretty good, I get the parts. The triggers, for example. The triggers go bad on these the most, why? Because people don't let the revs come up full speed and then drop the blade. They pull the trigger, it starts up, they drop the blade, it's too much stress on the triggers. They're $60. There used to be $60 triggers. There's probably a lot more now. This is a flaw. This wire, because it hangs out the back, it gets too much back and forth movement. And so if you're going to fix something, be watching these and make sure this doesn't happen or your wire will actually disconnect over time. That one needs to be fixed. This tool was left out for a long time. It was used for seminars and stuff. I have a good one inside. And when we get ready to do a seminar, we'll have a good one out here. But people have to be trained and certified. If this isn't locked, this is a dangerous toy. Okay, kids, the last thing I want to say is I'm doing Substack.com now. I'm writing almost every other day. I write stories about how you can do this. There's books on there. How do you become a salvage miner? These are like second editions, and I have more I'm going to be putting up there. It costs you $5 a month to support us. It's the only way. We don't take anything through Facebook. In 15 years of being on Facebook and 15 years of being on YouTube, we've never taken and monetized anything. So Substack.com is my... Um, goal to use for support by writing and, and publishing all the books and stuff I've had rather than try to go find publishers and get them to offer to help me I'm going to go ahead and just self-publish it all so no it's not going to be all editorially accurate all the time in the sense of I'll have mistakes on there but it gives you a chance to go ahead and and see and understand what you can do if you want to live with a pure salvage living ethos I save more energy by not cutting down trees, by not making metal, by not making glass. Everything is salvaged but the nails, the screws, the insulation, and the wrappers, the underlayments. So if there's an, uh, any way on earth that you can actually save energy better and have it look better than this, other than make it all out of mud, 
I don't know what it is. And I want to share that with everybody and get more people to build this way. If we can do that, you can have a generation of pure salvage builders and they could effectively not have to import anything to build tiny houses that are possibly portable and thus you can go from one intentional village to another intentional village depending on what your passion of the moment is whether it's permaculture or art or whatever it is you could literally take your house with you when you go but not leave it on wheels and have it be just a trailer or a toxic box of all new materials that outgas on wheels it doesn't have to be a camper it can be a tiny house but have more than one have one here have one there have one someplace else when you're gone, have it be a and b Have it make you money if you need tax write-offs. Have it be a depreciated, you can depreciate it 10 years. So it's a depreciated asset that performs. It makes you an income. This is the best of all worlds if you don't know finance. You wanna have an appreciating asset. It goes up in value and it makes income while you own it and you get to depreciate it to nothing in 10 years. And if you don't sell it, there's no tax on it. And if it's a b and in Texas under 200 square foot and a portable building, there's no B&B tax on it, so your only tax would be your income tax off of it if you did B&B. You do 10 of these, you literally have yourself a very comfortable income for the rest of your life. Just don't let your family move in or people that you can't get rid of. That's the trick. So, if I can be of any assistance, become a Substack subscriber, paid subscriber. Write me questions you have and I will write articles about them, much more than you probably want to read. I love to write all that I could possibly put in there every time. Whether it's about the toxic air inside of the houses or the plastics or the vinyls that emulate estrogen and trick your body into thinking you're breathing estrogen. All these things I write about and I want you to know about because nobody in the industry wants you to know. They all are making houses where the buyer must be aware. That means you must be aware of what the problems are. There is no obligation of the seller anymore to do the research. So what's gonna happen to you in five years after you buy it? That's gone. It's a buyer beware world. So do your due diligence, read these articles, and then go out and consider buying a house. Where are you gonna put it at? Are they gonna let you put it there? Can you get it plumbed? Can you get it, do you need to plumb it? And what about electromagnetic fields? Electromagnetic radiation is horrible for your body and people are building their tiny houses with electromagnetic radiation all through it, whether it's the modems, the cell phones, or the AC electric. I write about these things and most people don't have a clue. Oh, we want to get into a tiny house. You have no idea all the things that can go wrong, including an outrageous amount of money paid on a loan and if it goes bad in a year, you're stuck with it. RV loans are a nightmare. So, please, consider building houses out of packages and materials that might cost you seven or ten thousand dollars and the house when you're finished might be worth thirty or forty thousand dollars and you build it with your own human energy thus you can't have it taxed against you because it is just a stack of trash piled up pretty that makes it a portable building and thus my loopholeology will show you over time it pays it pays stay in one of the houses Consider buying a package of materials and being taught how to put it together. Not necessarily from scratch and leave everything, everything. I mean, we'll give you a seminar to show you how to put that one thing together, not how to be the master carpenter of the world. And I do prefer people have a little experience. So we're going to have seminars where maybe we can teach some um, basic tool training, but you can get that from a lot of other places. You don't need to come to me for that. But if you're going to buy a package of materials and you want to put it together, in that case, I will help train you. Otherwise, I'm not just training everybody that walks in off the street. That doesn't happen. We're not doing seminars like that. So one week out of the month for a package bought by somebody, we'll have a seminar. They can bring their friends, their children, anybody they want to learn and take their package off and build it. That's part of the package. But you got to pay for the package. It's not a freebie. So please visit us more. We're going to be doing more videos, more Substack, and hopefully soon one of you is going to have a house too. Thanks a lot, guys. We'll see you later on. I'm going to just jump in here real quick as we're walking around. We're talking about the uh, EMFs and all these sort of situations. Do look up the website antennasource.com. Put in your address and see how many towers and uh, antennas are in your area. It's a really good wake-up call. You might want to get more shielding for yourself.
that's just one of the things you need to be thinking about when it comes down to your your health these days. There's a lot of things going on, a lot of deception about whether you should be getting jabbed, whether you should be wearing a mask. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on right now, controversial stuff. I support everything about the freedom of choice, how I take care of my body how my immune system works. I believe in natural immune systems. I believe in organic immune systems. At 66 years old, if you would told me, gee, you're one of the persons gonna die from that stuff, I'd have said, no, don't baloney me. I'm not afraid. I don't get scared because somebody's gonna get a cold or flu. I don't care how bad it is because I don't have a bunch of comorbidities. And what are comorbidities? That means you're almost gonna die anyway from something else, whether it's diabetes, being kept alive by drugs, or many other things. Heart That's disease. Comorbidities. And if you're super anxious, if you've got hyper anxiety, you're just as, you're gonna die of a heart attack because you're gonna drive yourself crazy and drive your blood pressure up. So, learn to get healthy. Take care of yourself. At 66 years old, I am out of shape in my opinion. I'm gonna be working out this year. I'm gonna be showing people again, how do we do this? If you wanna watch, I've got videos online. And they're very good too. And I'll show you again, how do you get your balance back? How do you do these things to, to develop that muscle tone? How do you eat? How do you get your LDLs down like I had to do and eat oatmeal and, and raisins and nuts and, and walk and ground? Get your feet on leather, on the ground, earth. It is the most healthy thing you can possibly do for your body. And these are the things you wanna to try to teach people. It's not just the house is healthy that you live in, which is essential, that you're breathing not a bunch of toxins, but this wood is outgassed a long time ago. These trees were a thousand years old and they were cut and they were cut 200 years ago. You can't even already cut the growth lines on some of this wood. It's that old. And yet, people go out and buy new junky wood, cut trees down, Look import that growth it from lines. around the world. And you have the most beautiful wood right here at our fingertips, all salvaged. That is age, that is solid. And so, this is not just about how do you save our planet, but it's also, how do you stay young? And, and I think it's appropriate. Should I show them what young should be? There's a bunch of things I've been learning recently. One of them is, of course, you want to learn how to be able to go ahead and bend, guys. And so that means learning how to bend. This is actually easier than it looks, huh? Now, one of the things is your mobility. And so you want to be able to go ahead and what? Stretch. And I say this as an old person with a broken back, right? And Trandy can tell you, I'm not bullshitting. I did break my back. So, I couldn't do that when I was in my 50s. These are some of the tricks I like to show everybody nowadays. Why? Because I shouldn't be able to do these. Now, that, that may not be impressive, but over time, some of these things are, and this should be hard. All my life, this would have been hard. So, what's different? I think differently. I act differently. I'm not gonna accept somebody else's belief system about I'm gonna be old and I'm in danger of getting uh, some version of some flu or cold. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of death. And I'm damn sure not afraid of some other doctor who looks much worse telling me I gotta take statins or anything other than good food, good exercise, low stress, good loving from the woman right behind your camera for example Hi. and <laughs> a passion for what you do. If you're doing stuff you don't want to be doing, that's not my fault. You're doing it. If it's killing you, the stress, your choice. You want to stay there? You stay there. Why? So you can keep all those things. Your life. But if you think about doing it different, here's some ideas. Stick with us. We'll be back. Lots more. Y'all have a great day. We're done again. Huh, third time, right?